Hello, my name is Anna Topolska and my presentation is based on my research, uh, which I did for my dissertation that funded last year. It concerns uh, a collection of photographs by Zbigniew Zielonacki from wartime Poznań and uh, the trauma that was experienced by the inhabitants of that city as seen in these photographs. Speaking of Zielonacki was one of the most famous Poznan uh, photojournalists and photographers of the 20th century. Awarded many times for his photographs before the war, he worked for Courier Poznański, a local newspaper, and after the war opened his own atelier Van Dyck and contributed to memorialization of many aspects of the city life, both for individual inhabitants, his clients, as well as for the entire community. During the war, Zielonacki managed to hide his cameras before German confiscation, which allowed him to read for them when in 1945 Soviets appeared in the city to fight Germans. He managed to document the last months of the war and first of all traces of war visible in the city landscape. This way Zielonacki created a visual history of transgression of Poznan inhabitants from war to a not yet full stable peace. As the images has, uh, have been uh, circulating in the city consfer in the form of postcards and in press and exhibitions, often becoming iconic, that visual tale has been imprinted in the visual memory of subsequent generation of Poznan inhabitants and still prompts lively discussions, especially in the case of the most controversial ones, uh, these from the execution of Arthur Greisel. Uh, the photos which I have in mind in this presentation are stored in the Virtual Museum of uh, History of Poznan Cyril and concern years 1945-1947, so the ending of the war and times right after it. The collection of about 600 photographs was donated to the Cyril Museum by the son of the photographer. It consists of nine albums, The Process and Execution of Arthur Greiser, German Camp in Żabikowo, Fort 7, German Police and Arrest and Forced Labor Camp, Gestapo, German Custody on Wojenska Street, Funerals of Victims, and Celebration Anniversary Processions. A group of 11 pictures has been separated by the cura curators and has not been made public and is available only for research purposes. Photography, as we know, despite its mimetic character, is not an objective medium. It mediates events which are remembered as images and then circulate in culture. In this process, photography reproduces culturally understandable topoi, which use in a given context deliver particular meaning. However, photography is also able to bring about an uh, experience which goes far beyond visual language of a given culture and can be a kind of Barthesian punctum. On both of these levels, a photography is a materialization of memory, which Birner wrote about. It is a carrier of that memory between generations and has power to participate in processes of bringing to the surface and working through collective and individual world trauma. It is particularly interesting and possibly effective then to look at photographs which have a local range to analyze the issue of visualization of world trauma and its place and role in people's communities. It is because, uh, because visuality of local memory, as we can see on the example of Zielonacki's photographs, functions exactly at the intersection of narrative and non-narrative, private and public, individual and collective. Referring to these aspects, I will show on examples that some of the images constitute a part of the emerging main war narratives which are carried throughout decades in the war iconography of Poznan in general and try to deal with the war trauma either through suppression or through glorification of suffering. And I will show also that there are photographs, uh, some, some, some of these photographs, um, although became an important element of local memory, do not fit any of those uh, narratives and are a window into the core of the most traumatic feelings of Poznan inhabitants via the unstructured, ambiguous ways of dealing with them. The communist version of the new identity built on the ruins of war was triumphal and monumental. What can be seen if we take into consideration the entire visual dimension of war memory in Poznan? But there was also a suppressed version of memory which, contra in contrast to the triumphal rhetoric of communists, had martyrological character. This memory was also demanding visualization and institutionalization what was gradually occurring. 
it was strongly connected to the historical background and pre-war pre -war political preferences uh, of the majority of inhabitants on these territories. One of its most important symptoms was the history of emerging uh, narrative around the Wielkopolska Martyrology Museum of Fort Seven, a former Nazi concentration camp functioning during the war in Poznan. The communist authorities did not want to commemorate their place as around it their political opponents, including right-wing activists, both from before and after the war, were gathering. Nevertheless, the museum finally opened in the 1980s and focused on the harms done to the local people by the Nazis. Some of Zielnowski's photographs are displayed in the museum permanent exhibition up to this day. There is also an album within the collection of Zielnowski photos, which entirely focuses on Fort 7 visited by the photographer right after German's withdrawal. It shows the entrance to the fort and its interior as left by the occupier. I will show you now. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the the photographs I have in mind. Yeah, it's here. Okay. Some examples uh, of uh, photographs from the album Fort Seven. But there are four pictures in the same album uh, from an event which was the symbolic beginning of the emergence of a grassroots initiative related to the counter memoir of Poznan co community and religious character of it. It was the celebration of unveiling of a wooden cross above the main entrance to the fort. And here the next, my next slide with photos from that event. The cross was not approved by the communist authorities who decided that the area of the fort would be a military zone, not a site of memory. However, it was left there and after the collapse of communists was substituted by an iron, iron one. And the image of the cross above the fort entrance circulated in the iconosphere of that counter memory, such as, for example, booklets concerning the site. And the photos of Zielnacki, um, we can see the crowds which supported this version of memory and gathered at the event. Um, to this narrative also belong the photographs from other sites of Nazi atrocities in Poznan, Zabikovo, Gestapo prison on Muinska street, including the photos of Mars graves, dead bodies of victims and exhumations. Mm, next slide here. There is also a large collection of photographs from the funerals of victims, also those exhumed, uh, carried out in Poznan right after the war in 1945. Another large collection, which as the photo, photos of the funerals refers to the act of mourning of the city, gathers photographs of ruins of both the old town and other districts. Okay, some examples from the collection. Uh, the main point of this visual narrative refers to the idea that Poles, here Poznan inhabitants, played mainly the role of victims during the war. Uh, that victimhood does not assume uh, the trauma to be healed at, as it is the main component of the identity and goes back to the mixed tradition of Christianity with its notion of martyrdom and Polish history under partitions and its literary representations, such as that of Poland being the Christ of nations suffering on the cross. In this situation, traumatic events must be celebrated beyond the act of mourning, must be commemorated, and through incorporation of them into the collective identity, are transformed into a sense of moral victory and power. Especially in a situation in which, as it was in Poznań, official authorities promoted another narrative and fought to, com to suppress the former. Then the moral victory does not refer to the um, historical time um, of the commemorative events, uh, not only refers to, uh, to the historical time of the commemorative events, but also to the current political situation and struggles. Such process needs visual signs of martyrdom, and they come in the, come in the form of photographs, more or less symbolic, from the, those of dead bodies of exhumed victims in my, mass graves through mass funerals going through the city center and direct references to symbolic, uh, to religious uh, symbols like these, for example. And 
are there also images that speak of the suffering in a more, more subtle way? And I would like now to look not at these obvious pictures, but at one which has a dimension of Bartizian punctum, at the same time remaining within the dimension narrative of a victimhood of the city. Okay, I will show you the photo which I have in mind now. Uh, yes, and this is the, the photo of a smashed clock face from, from the city hall tower in Poznań. The size of the clock face, of which we can see only a half, is emphasized by the contrast with, with people in the background and the person standing right next to it in a black coat trying to declutter the clock. Such image has a very clear symbolic meaning. It says that the time, in a sense, stopped for the city. The clock with which stops the working usually foretells eve and death. The photograph is an expression of an unimaginable trauma which was experienced by the city and its inhabitants during the war. A smashed clock symbolizes some ending, an experience after which the time has to be counted anew. Memory in Poznań, as I argue in my dissertation, based on more comprehensive studies, had in the post-war decades its own specificity resulting from the historical background and the role of the territories where Poznań was located during the war. The memory which was imposed up, uh, imposed up down by the communist authorities in the visual sphere was emphasizing the thesis about the liberation of Poznań and the entire Poland by the Soviet Union and about Polish-Soviet friendship. The memory visualized in the city space by the authorities was on the one hand strongly a part of global discourses connected to the Cold War division of the world, but on the other hand also taking into account this, that specificity of Poznań and was drawing a picture which would allow the authorities to gain some kind of legitimization on these terrains and would distance them from the martyrological rhetoric related to, among others, right-wing and Dacia circles of Poznań. Therefore, despite general tendency of the communists to emphasize Polish suffering from the hands of Germans and not from Soviets, official war memory in Poznań was different from that in the Eastern territories where people remembered Soviet occupation and communist, poli communist politics of commemoration had other challenges to fight. In Poznań, they chose to underline clearly the triumphal narrative of liberation and victory uh, with the obelisk with red star towering over the city from the first days after the end of the war. And here is the obelisk. Um, looking at the photographs from the collection of Zielnacki, we can see this new emerging narrative together with the beginning of the new gradually introduced political system. There are images of military parades attended by communist officials, first of May gatherings with displays of portraits of Joseph Stalin, Soviet propaganda posters, among other elements of the post-war reality. What would reinforce the rhetoric of a triumph gradually developed on various levels of public sphere in the post-war Poznan. Here trauma is suppressed and ideally substituted by um, feelings of pride through the narrative of Polish-Soviet victorious brotherhood of arms and gratefulness towards Soviet Union. The symbols of the new order, however, in the Zielonacki photographs were intertwining with the previous ones. Uh, let me show you, next slide, okay. Um, but in the context of, context of victory and more and more firm establishment of the new authorities were more and more strong, these new symbols, and were taking over the public sphere. Here are some more examples of the new symbols, new, 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 new images. Uh, the first shows the 1st of May celebrations. The next one is from the rally on the occasion of victory over Germany features and features a banner saying eternal Polish Soviet friendship. Then we can see a lot of photographs documenting victorious official march of the second Polish army, a formation connected to the Soviet Union and big celebrations of the anniversary of the Wielkopolski uprising from the end of the first world war won by Poznan citizens to reinforce uh, the feeling of pride and sense of victory among inhabitants. But there are also photographs which do not fit uh, any of these two main emerging war narratives. 
Such are the photographs uh, of the process and execution of Arthur Greiser. Uh, here, some photos from the process of Arthur Greiser, the Nazi deputy in the Vaterland with the headquarter in Poznań, responsible for Germanization, extermination and expulsions of thousands of greater Poland inhabitants. First of all, it can be said that the photographs were an expression of a need of, uh, to revenge, or as a popular booklet from 1946 wanted, a sense of historical justice of Poznan inhabitants because of the atrocities he had committed or supervised. This makes them on the one hand morally ambiguous. Should we visualize death of our per perpetrators and watch it as a spectacle? But on the other is an expression of an unstructured, non-narrative feeling of the community, neither martyrological nor triumphal. These photographs rhetorically rather contribute to the very local feelings, and if we would like to talk about any kind of propaganda inscribed in them, it would be rather the narrative of local unification of inhabitants collectively experiencing historical justice, a moment of collective experience extended through the medium of photograph in time and space. Visual rhetoric of them reach for the aesthetics of objective documentary photography, but the feelings uh, they were triggering and the audience uh, were corresponding with, on the one hand, people's need for revenge, not necessarily a cautious element of working through the war trauma, or need for historical justice, more often verbalized in the sources, as I mentioned earlier. And on the other hand, with a sense of humanity, which was um, uh, which made some people condemn public visualization of suffering of every person, including perpetrators, as the album raised a dispute among both the uh, inhabitants and Polish intellectuals. Uh, the album includes firstly photographs from the proceedings of the court, highest national tribunal in the assembly hall of the University of Poznań, depicting fully packed room. This mass participation must also have been the message with the, which the photographer wanted to convey to his audience and future generations. But at the time when the Nuremberg trials were ongoing since 1945, this collection of images became a part of the iconography of the post-war anti-Nazi trials. It did not differ from other visual reports of such kind. All the documentary photographs from these trials have similar aesthetics, which includes elements such as presence of flags and coats of arms of the victorious states, highlighted judges depicted as serious, noble and focused, as well as defendants which, uh, with heads down and body positions revealing or humiliation or arrogance guarded by soldiers. The message of those images was simple to confirm who is the victor, to show that the victors are righteous, and that all the outcomes of the trials would be historically justified. The rhetorical message of Greiser's photographs from the trial was no different, the historical justice in the making. Through the discussed uh, aesthetic interventions, uh, their author aimed at giving people a sense of this justice. After all, they go had gone uh, through during the war. Zielonatki's photographs were triumphal, but their visual connotations were rather Western. Also, we do not see Soviet flags in them. Secondly, there are photographs from the execution of Greiser, also those excluded from the public view. Um, my last slide. Uh, we see that the execution gathered even bigger number of spectators than the process. The message which we can read from the described uh, photographs, besides the unifying power of the event and what follows a community building process, concerned the experience of an immediate sense of justice and revenge. But despite the author's intention uh, in and the majority reading it, it, it this way, there appeared a dispute surrounding the discussed images. It is often said that camera is a kind of weapon and the process of taking photo is a violent act. By taking a photo of someone's suffering, death or, or humiliation, one can re-victimize them. But what about the images of suffering and death of the perpetrators of those victims? Do these problems also apply to them? Are we entitled to take and look at such photographs? The dispute was at times violent as one day someone destroyed the glass case outside the atelier of Zielnacki where the images were displayed. 
It was a former prisoner of one of the concentration camps who said that was worried about the impact of such images on mental health of youth and children. The images also aroused an objection of influential intellectuals. For instance, Eva Shelbuk Zarembina was explaining that taking the role of the executioner for revenge is a perversion of humanity and that showing photographs of atrocities reminded her the passion of Nazis for publishing similar pictures. In result, it was the last public execution in Poland, as under the pressure of the indignation of intellectuals, this kind of executions of German criminals was also condemned by the Minister of Justice. To summarize. Okay. I'm back here. Okay, so to summarize my presentation, uh, the vast collection of Zielonacki photographs connected to the pro uh, processes of dealing with war trauma in a local context of Poznań and immediate post-war decades give us an insight into, into three different ways of doing so. Two competing main narratives, the official triumphal one of Soviet liberation, which offers suppression of the traumatic memories, and the grassroots counter-memory of victimhood and martyrdom, and the third one incorporating both a sense of injustice and harm and feeling of victory with which offered an immediate sense of satisfaction and revenge through visualization of execution of the person responsible for Nazi atrocities in the greater Poland. The third one was pointed out to be unhealthy, but it shows the dark side of impossibility to overcome a deep trauma which situates on the intersection of individual and collective, narrative and unstructured, non-narrative and private and public. Today, the most of the last group of images are no longer publicly available. Thank you very much.